Can I ask, because the children are coming down, who here is seven years old? Is there anyone here who's seven years old? Wow. Well, guess what? You are the same age as the church in its new form when the plant came seven years ago today. So why don't we just give a massive clap to God for all that he's done for the same Thanksgiving. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And, and why don't we say a prayer of thanksgiving to God for all that he's been doing with us. Lord, thank you that we can celebrate. Um, thank you that you love celebrations and laughter and fun. And we thank you that today we are able to celebrate seven years of amazing things that you've been doing in our lives. We want to give you thanks for every person in this church, every person who's been through um, this church over the years. And we pray for the next seven years, Lord, that they will be even better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Keep the Bible open in front of you. I think it was page 1153, 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. It's good to be in your presence. It's good to worship you. And Lord, we thank you so much. That's not a one-way offering of our hearts to you, but that you come and meet with us and speak to us. And as you, by your spirit, have softened our hearts as we have sung praise to you, we pray, Lord, speak into those hearts that they might become contagious. Ignite a passion for the lost. Ignite a passion for your world the passion you have for the creation that you have made. So speak to us this morning, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to reiterate a few things that Ed's already said, we are uh, right at the beginning of Invite 2012, our year of evangelism, where we are looking uh, outside of the, our four walls, outside of one another, uh, to those who don't net yet know Jesus. And we're beginning uh, the year with a series called Becoming a Contagious Christian, trying to look at ways in which we can share our faith uh, in a way that is natural, spontaneous, uh, infectious, in a, in a sense where we just can't help ourselves from sharing what we're passionate about and seeing people beginning to follow Jesus for themselves. It's a six-week series, and uh, each week we're following that with some material uh, to get our teeth into in, co in connect groups. And uh, this week, it's a really important week. We're going to do a little questionnaire together uh, to look at our natural styles of communication and how we might share our faith in a way that suits us. Uh, so if you're not in a connect group, this week is a great week to join one. So I'd really encourage you, if you haven't filled in one of those connect cards, do so. We make a huge effort to try and respond to you the next day. Uh, and connect groups are usually on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. And, uh, and so we should be able to get you in time with a suggestion for you to join a connect group. Alternatively, you can grab a connect group leader uh, who, will be, who might be in the congregation this morning. Uh, there's a book as well accompanying uh, the series called Becoming a Contagious Christian by Mark Mittelberg. Uh, if you haven't read that, I'd encourage you to read that as well. Just read a few chapters each week uh, and keep up with the series. Last week we looked at uh, Christianity as a contagious faith, uh, that it is in essence mission. You don't have the, uh, Christianity as a religion that sends missionaries. Christianity is mission, and if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a missionary. And so we looked at that was because everyone matters to God, and everyone is far from God. But the great news is that everyone can make disciples. You and me, we're part of that process. So he gives us this single purpose to make disciples in all the world, to go on an adventure with him, uh, to enjoy the privilege of seeing lives changed by the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that is pretty exciting, isn't it? Now I had the great joy of going to the Kingdom Connect group on Tuesday, and they were excited about that too, but they were also very, very afraid. Now, you can understand that, can't you? In fact, one person said that the word to describe how he was feeling was terror. 
terror. And the reason for that is evangelism, sharing our faith, telling others what we believe, is difficult. But why is evangelism so difficult? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons, really. The first one is that so often it can feel quite forced, can't it? We can feel fake. I'm sure you've had one of those conversations that somehow feels natu- unnatural and awkward, where uh, you just know that you, your words ring hollow, that you feel insincere and artificial. Perhaps you've uh, had that moment where, or you've been on the receiving end of that moment where you're enjoying a summer barbecue, perhaps, or a dinner party at night. And uh, at the barbecue, there you are outside in the garden, drinking a glass of wine, enjoying the barbecue, enjoying the beauty of the garden. And someone says, Wow, the trees are looking amazing at the moment, aren't they? And suddenly you seize your opportunity and you jump in and you find yourself blurting out, Yes, the trees, they're beautiful, aren't they? Jesus, he died on a tree. And there's silence. (laughs) And somebody sips a glass of wine, and someone else looks at their sausage and says, these sausages are good, aren't they? And the conversation carries on. It's awkward, isn't it? We feel that we are used car salesmen with a, a job to do. We feel obliged to somehow share our faith, often without really knowing what we believe ourselves or why we believe it. We know that we uh, believe a number of strange beliefs. We believe in God. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection from the dead. We believe in heaven and hell. Strange things to believe um, and communicate to others. Because what we realize is if we believe these things, then we think that gets you to heaven. But... If that's true, that's quite a difficult thing to communicate. It it feels weird, doesn't it? It feels odd. It feels rather strange. And we're not sure that sort of message actually makes any difference in people's lives at all because we know ourselves so often we are just the same as those around us. It's just that we have these weird personal beliefs that no one else has. And so when it comes to that moment where we need to share our faith, we feel exposed, we feel like a fraud. But it's just not that sense of being fake or fraudulent. It's also that we fear. We fear ridicule. We fear we're going to be embarrassed when we open up and share what matters to us. We are worried about rejection and hostility. We're also deeply concerned, I think, That when the moment comes and there is an opportunity that is a little bit better than the trees in the garden opportunity, that actually we're going to blow it. The moment is there, God wants to use us, and we choke and we mess it up. And so we never say anything for fear of messing it up. And it means we never say anything at all, and we live lives pickled by low-level guilt a kind of deep hum of shame, a sense of failure. And you know, this morning, I I just want to say right from the outset, I don't want to add to that. This is not a sermon, this is not a series which is supposed to be beating you up and saying, you should be doing better, really. Because you know, I hope by now, that I don't believe that guilt has any place in the Christian life at all. So, Evangelism is difficult. Sharing our faith, telling others. How can we make it easier? Can we make evangelism easier? Well, I think the answer to that is both yes and no. There is a reality that sharing our faith, telling others, is always going to be difficult. I remember Nick Pollard, an evangelist with the Damaris Trust, wrote a book called How to Make Evangelism Slightly Less Difficult. It's hard. Um, But there are ways of doing it, I think, that uh, aren't so false or so fearful. And so I want to take you on a journey this morning from fake to real and from fear to faith. I want to move from fake and fear to reality and faith. And I want to suggest to you that the key way to do that can be found in the verses that Dee read for us from 1 Peter. 
The way to make evangelism just slightly less difficult is to live lives that provoke questions. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Has someone ever asked you about your faith? It's much easier to respond to a question with an answer, isn't it, than it is to start up a conversation in the first place. They've taken the risk and asked you a question. They've made themselves vulnerable. They've set the agenda. So it's not forced or fake in any way. It's coming from their hearts. And we don't have to be afraid because we're not the ones taking the risk. They've already done it for us. So the question is, is does your life provoke questions in your workplace? Nursery? At home? With your neighbours on your street? Do you provoke questions? And how? How can you provoke questions? Well, Peter says it's by having a contagious heart that beats inside your chest. A contagious heart. And so what we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at 1 Peter, and we're just going to work through a series of questions together that will take us to that place of what it means to have a contagious heart. So let's ask the first question, how do we provoke questions? I think there are two things to say here. Firstly, that we need to live different, and secondly, that change matters So let's begin with this idea that we need to live different. It's a key theme in Peter's letter. Turn over, if you would, to uh, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, just over the page, verse 12. This is the verse, really, that is the hinge, the fulcrum of the entire book. It's the manifesto verse of what Peter is saying in this first letter, and he says this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Live such good lives among the pagans, that's just a word for the irreligious, for unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. He visits us. And then what he does over the next two chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3, he unpacks that verse in its specific contexts that the Christians he's writing to find themselves in. So he says, how do you live a good life in your dealings with the authorities and the state? What does the Christian life look like in that context? What about in the workplace with your boss? What does a good life look like in that context? And what about in the home with your family, husbands and wives? How do you live good lives with them so that you are communicating the love of Jesus to them? How can you live a life that is distinct, that is explicitly Christian, that is unmistakably full of Jesus? How can you live different. But it's not just living different that makes, that matters here. It's that change matters too. You see, these Christians, they used to be the same as the pagans. They used to join in with everything that they did, but suddenly something changed and they don't anymore. Just flick over to chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4. This is what Peter says here. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. And they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. You see... What Peter is saying here is that these new Christians who had begun to follow Jesus were living provocative lives. They stood out as completely different and their lives had been completely transformed by the love of Jesus. And that meant that their relationships were different. Now I'm sure you have seen the way people conduct relationships in your workplace. We're called to be different. That what they did in their leisure times 
were different. Their priorities, what they gave their lives for, were different. I remember when uh, I became a Christian, I was 15 years of age, and um, I began to follow Jesus, but nothing really changed. I read my Bible every day, I prayed every day, I went to church every week, twice on a Sunday, and I went to Bible study on a Wednesday. That's pretty good, isn't it? Come on. Yes, that's pretty good. Nobody knew any of those things about me because my lifestyle was exactly the same as it had been before. I still chased girls, I still got drunk, I still swore like a trooper. Nothing had changed in my life. And then I encountered the Holy Spirit that summer. And my poor parents had an extraordinary shock because they experienced the immediate change in my life. And I appreciate their graciousness. But then people saw that I was different at school in the sixth form. And so in the first year, no one ever asked me a single question about my Christian faith. In the second year, I conducted uh, debates that involved the whole form. I was engaged in discussions over break every single day. People asked me questions every single day because they had seen me here and now I was completely different. I had changed and it was funny actually because it was the Christians that took quite a long time to believe that I was really sincere because they had never seen somebody living the lifestyle that I had been living actually becoming a Christian and changing. So it took them a while to believe that this was a real thing that God was doing in my life. But funnily enough, those who didn't believe, they were the ones that saw it first. So the question is, do you get asked questions by those around you who don't believe? Have your colleagues noticed that you're different? And you know, if they haven't, something has gone wrong in your life. Because today we have so many opportunities to be weird, to be different, to stand out. It may be that someone tells a joke. How do you respond to that joke? It may be that you're invited to a party. How do you conduct yourself in that party? When you go out for a drink after work, how many drinks do you have? When your colleagues gossip and backbite, do you join in? You see, Peter here is saying, live a provocative life. Just make waves in your workplace. Rock the boat a little bit and see what happens. Reject fake, he says, and be real. Just makes telling others a little bit easier. So how do we provoke questions? We live different because change matters. We reject the fake, we live real. But how should we actually answer those questions once we have begun to live lives that provoke questions? Well again, there's two things. We need to know our stuff and we need to be ourselves. So number one, know your stuff. Look at uh, verse 15 of chapter 3 that was read for us today. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Be ready. Be able to respond when someone is vulnerable enough to ask you a question that they want to hear an answer to. Do you have those sorts of answers? Can you offer a reason, a defense? The word in Greek here is the word from which we get our word apologetics. Can you defend the faith? Can you say why you believe what you believe? Do you actually believe that you've got something that's worth hearing, that you've got something to say? I hope so. I do. Colossians uh, is uh, Paul's uh, challenge to us, really, to live in this same way. Peter writes this letter, Paul writes Colossians. In chapter 4, Paul says, and he's in prison when he says this, he says, make the most of every opportunity. It's not like he has the freedom to be going around, uh, just speaking to people wherever they might be. 
He's not speaking to lots of people like I am this morning. He's in prison, and he's still writing, saying, make the most of every opportunity, just like he was, even though he was in chains. How did he do that? Well, he knew what he believed. He knew that Christianity is not religion, it is rescue. It's not what we do for God, it is what God through Jesus has done for us. As Peter says here, look in verse 18, Jesus Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He has done it for us. And know why you believe it. Know what difference it has made in your life. You're the shop window. Not this service, not our website. Not a little booklet. Your life is the shop window as people look to see whether the good news of Jesus Christ, of what he has done for us, has changed the way you live. And don't say what you think you ought to say. Remember, reject the fake, be real. And that means being yourself. Being yourself. You see, it's not just a matter of what you answer. It's also about how you answer. How you live and what you say go together. And that means two things. It means, firstly, that you need to find your fit. You need to find your approach, your style, what works for you, how you can be yourself. Now, you might naturally be confrontational, like Peter was, the apostle. You might be intellectual, like Paul, and enjoy good debates. Uh, You might be invitational, like the Samaritan woman who invited all her friends to meet Jesus, who had um, told her who she was. You might be testimonial, like the blind man who didn't really know very much, but he knew what Jesus had done for him, and he could tell his story. You might be uh, brilliant with relationships, like Matthew, and just hold great parties that all your friends come to, where you can tell them about Jesus. You might be able to serve others and communicate practically the love of God, like Dorcas did. If, you want to, if you're not sure what your style is, get in a connect group, get there this week, do the questionnaire, find out. It is incredibly freeing. But Peter says, whatever your style, all of us are called to have a posture of gentleness and respect. Look at verse uh, 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's what he says throughout this letter. Doing good looks like gentleness and respect. Whether you are dealing with the authorities, whether you are at work, whether you are at home, that's what he talks about, lives of reverence and submission, and our answers ought to be the same as our lives. Our answers ought to reflect our lives. We need to be authentic. And so again, it is reject what is fake, instead be real. So how do we answer once we've provoked... We need to know our stuff, you need to be yourself, reject the fake, be real. But what response should we expect as we give an answer? Is it going to be easy? Are people always going to say, that's amazing, thank you so much, I've always wanted to know that, I'm going to follow Jesus now. That's not what Peter says. He says to these Christians, expect persecution. Now, I think where we are in East London, very often persecution can feel a little distant, a little remote. It can feel historically remote. So we can read about the Apostle Peter who died by being crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified the same way his Lord was. He said, I'm not worthy of that. I'm not going to renounce his name, so crucify me upside down. And the Romans did because they were not very nice. 
Or we might hear the story of uh, Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, who was 86 years old, and during one particular Roman persecution, the proconsul said to him, take the oath and I'll let you go, revile Christ. And he said in response, for 86 years, I have been his servant and he has done me no wrong. So how can I blaspheme his name now? 86 years old he was, and his hands and his feet were tied together. He was tied to a stake. Wood was stacked around him, and he was burnt to death, and a spear was thrust into his heart as he burnt. That can feel historically distant from us, can't it? It can also feel, I think, geographically rather remote, almost exotic even. We read about Boko Haram and they, uh, their burning of churches in Nigeria. Or we read about the communists waterboarding Christians in North Korea. Or we hear about pastors of churches in Iran who are being beheaded and executed for their faith. And it feels distant and remote from our experience of what a provocative life looks like. But Peter here says that actually persecution, it's not the first thing you experience. Persecution begins with hostility. And so we're to expect persecution, but actually we are to assume hostility. In 1 Peter, it's not violent persecution. It's verbal hostility that these Christians are facing in their lives. So uh, flick over to chapter 2, verse 12, and you get accusation. Or in chapter 3, verse 9, you see insults. Or in verse 14 of chapter 3, threats. There's malicious slander in chapter uh, 3, verse 16. There's abuse in chapter 4, verse 4. You see... That's something we can relate to a little bit more, isn't it? Peter's context, the context of these Christians in Turkey in the first century, was much more like ours is today. I'm sure all of you have been impacted by the resurgence of new atheism that say reason and faith are opposed to one another, something we've never believed but so many of our friends do now. And so religion, people like you and me who believe in God, we're just stupid. Or perhaps it's the rise of fundamentalism, whether that is in its Islamic form or its American form or its African form. And its impact particularly on uh, gender and sexuality. And so not only are we stupid, but we're now dangerous. Religion is inherently violent. I have to say, I look out at all of you and I think, you do look quite dangerous. I must say, a few of you, particularly if you've got a moustache, <laughs> quite dangerous. Sorry, Henrik. Then, you know, that was actually my story too. So, yes, my life that changed after I'd had this experience of the Holy Spirit provoked questions, which was amazing. It also provoked hostility and opposition. So I remember at school, a group of students got together to organize what was a horrendously blasphemous, insulting play just to have a go, to respond. Uh, I was involved in a debate which was incredibly hostile, and it felt like it was me defending the faith against the entire year. My brother became a Christian that year, and my father banned him from going to the same church as me because he worried that we were joining a cult. My sister ridiculed us and told us how Jesus definitely didn't love her. And my dad said to me, Rod, I could never believe because Christians throw their brains out the window. You see, it's not as distant and as remote as we think it is. And so the fear I can understand, because in reality, evangelism is hard. What response should we expect? We should expect persecution. We should assume hostility. 
And so fear makes sense. And what that means is we need to replace fear with faith. How do we do that? How can we be fearless in the face of hostility? How can we be fearless in the face of hostility? Well, Peter says, it's all down to your contagious heart. Look at verse 15. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. I'm sure, maybe you're, you're this, these, these, these people, but I'm sure you have experienced the annoying couple who have fallen madly in love with each other. They've been together a month. They are seriously into each other, almost literally, and uh, they are entwined all the time, you know, whispering sweet nothings to one another, driving your potty. They are infatuated with one another. There's this incredible enthusiasm and passion for one another. They are excited about their relationship. They're excited about being in love. And having a contagious heart means that we are speaking about the one we love. Do you do that? Can you speak about the one you love? And is that one Jesus? Have you and are you cultivating a love for Jesus? Are you fascinated by Jesus? Is he almost irresistible to you? Because if he is, then I think two things happen. One, your life will provoke questions. Just because you're passionate about Jesus, because you love him, and his life begins to seep out through yours as you become transparent to the Spirit. But also, you'll find talking about him will just become easy, because you, everybody talks about the things they love, don't they? The question is, is what are those things that you love? So how do you cultivate that sort of love for Jesus? How do you guard your heart? Well, you replace fear with faith. And the first way you do that is by embracing salvation. Look at verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. You see, we might provoke questions, and the reaction might be a hostile one, but Jesus knew that hostility. Jesus knew that persecution. He suffered for your sins and for mine to bring us to God. He was righteous. He suffered for you and me, the unrighteous. He gave us his righteousness and took from us our unrighteousness. So he died in our place for our sins as our substitute. There is this great exchange, his righteousness for my unrighteousness. And it brings me forgiveness for all the things I've done wrong in my life. It grants me freedom and the power to live a new life by his spirit. So on the cross, Jesus faced the full force of evil for you and for me. He bore in his body God's wrath against all the wrongdoing in our lives for you and for me. And he took your unrighteousness and he gave you his perfect righteousness. That's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? He suffered so that he could do that for you. And so it's as we suffer, as we share our faith, that we realize just how Jesus suffered. It helps us to appreciate how much he loved us and does love us. It draws us into a relationship with him of empathy and sympathy and intimacy. But actually more than that, it draws us into a relationship of spiritual union, of deeper participation in his sufferings. Paul talks about that, and it's this extraordinary mystery. But what it does as we 
go back to the foot of the cross, as we see what Jesus did for us, how he suffered for us, it gives us the resources we need to resist. It enables us to replace fear with faith as we realize what it is he's done for you and for me. But we don't just embrace salvation. We also anticipate victory. You see, Jesus' suffering is not the end. The cross wasn't a defeat. God vindicates Jesus. He raises him from the dead. He accepts his sacrifice on behalf of all of us. And so Peter traces uh, this victory parade. You may have read these words many times before and not been quite sure what Peter's talking about. But what he's saying is basically this. I have made Jesus alive, and I have sent him on a lap of honor. This is a, a victory parade, like the winning team on the bus coming back into their city, carrying the cup. And so Jesus starts in hell, and he proclaims his victory, his triumph over sin and evil, over death, over Satan, he goes into the heart of darkness and he says, you have lost. <laughs> the lamb wins. You're in trouble. You thought you were victorious. But I have defeated you. And from there, he ascends to the right hand of his Father in heaven, far above all principalities and powers, over every authority in this world. And he says, I am Lord, and every knee will bow before me. So, you have nothing to be afraid of. Nothing. He is the Lord, and he is on your side. And his suffering is not the end. And that means that your suffering is not the end. And so he gives us hope. Whatever it feels like tomorrow morning when you go and your life provokes questions, and some of them are hostile, you know that one day it will be different. And so you replace fear with faith. Not just because of what he's done for you, but what he will do one day. So how can we be fearless in the face of hostility? We need contagious hearts that are passionate for Jesus, that love Jesus. We need to embrace salvation. That's how we love him more, as we understand what he's done for us. As we anticipate his victory, what he will do for us. Our hearts are stirred within us, aren't they? And we begin that journey from fear to faith. So just to draw things together simply. Evangelism is always hard. Telling others is a difficult thing to do. So don't feel bad about that. The easiest way to do it is to live such good lives amongst those around you, that they ask you questions, to live, to reject the fake, to be real. And when you get those questions, you need to know your stuff and you need to be yourself. And you need to replace fear with faith. It means you need to fall in love with Jesus as you embrace his salvation as you anticipate his victory. That's what it means to have a contagious heart. Let me pray for you. Why don't we stand as we...